Oh, come on, right here. Oh, thank you, sir. Ha ha. We're gonna get any snow tonight. Oh yeah. It's supposed to. At least a foot. Today we are talking. Oh man, he hit us with a long one. Oh. Resonances Ooh. and materials. Ooh. Okay. This is your specialty, right? Kind of, sort of, yeah. Yeah. It, uh, Self-proclaimed. Something like that. Been doing it a long time. Listening to materials. So how far back you want to go? We could start from the early days. In the early, the early days when we bought materials well, I remember specifically. remember when I was sucking on my bottle. And no. Maybe not that after that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I don't know, did they have latex back then? Was nipples, were nipples made of latex? I don't know what the hell the material was. I guess latex probably goes back to the 60s. Sure. Well, that's a material. I'm yeah. Just saying, you know. Okay. You think about how a nipple is. It has a particular... A baby bottle nipple. Well, now they got all kinds of newfangled designs. Right, we're getting way off topic. Yeah. Right I'm just saying that material has a resonance to it, right? <laughs> yeah. Right, of course. You, you, you twang it, and it makes a certain kind of noise or feel. Yep. As, well, that's that's a resonance, right? That materials have resonances, and that's kind of things we have to de deal with with speaker drivers. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, in terms of cable design, yeah, the um, uh, the materials mattered a lot. It uh, everything. You, when you start, when you're able to, cr when you're able to produce a conductor, and an insul out of whatever material you'd like, as long as you could afford to make the ver change the variables, then put a various dielectrics on that, in in a number of fashions. They have different ways of extruding it. You could do a, a pressurized extrusion, which forces the dielectric to intimately to the surface of the conductor. You can do a tubular extrusion, which basically creates a tube out of, conduct, out of the insulator and barely touches the uh, uh, the conductor underneath, say it's whether it's stranded or solid core, or you can do somewhere in between, where you tangen tangentially have the uh, insulating material just touch the outer strand of the stranding and minimize the surface area. And believe it or not, all that changes the sound of that single conductor. But what about headphones? Yeah, well, we got to get to that. <laughs> yeah. So that so now so now you get into the way just the materials are applied to it. Then you get into the various sounds of the materials, which, in an electrical system, um, is very similar to a mechanical system. Although most people probably don't think so, but the mm. the PVC actually will will have a different sound than polyethylene. Will have a different sound than uh, a polyimid. Uh, or an enamel coat on a solid core wire. Uh, those same, you can take the same copper conductor and apply different uh, materials to the outside surface of it and, um, and actually alter the sound of that. Anyway, right, in materials, in, in cabling, materials matter, they have a sound. And yep. there's, there, I'm sure there's all kinds of electrical formula that we could go through or a hardcore physicist to talk about to figure out why that is. I had a, I remember that actually a friend of mine, not a friend of mine, a customer of ours was a ma hardcore mathematician. And he calculated, um, he, I don't even know how he did it. He, cal he, he was taking all the potential variables, I guess his friend was a physicist. They were trying to take all the potential variables in a cable, every, any potential variable, yep. and figure out what the, I think it was the mean variation, what, they were trying to calculate mathematically in formula what the percentage variation or something like that would be taking all the variables in an electrical system, I guess. And they came up to something that was like, it was like 0.1% or 0.2%, whatever. You told me 0.2. The, the 0.2, yeah, yeah, which doesn't sound like a lot. It does but, not. But, but from a standpoint of a high-end system, that 0.2% or that under 1% is what everyone's pretty much tweaking once you get to the upper end echelon of things. Yeah. yeah. You know? And so somewhere along the way, even on, on really low-level signals, I think, it, it's a, there's a potential for that single cable to have an effect. Now, they're just looking at one cable. Right. They're not looking at an entire system. Yeah, additive. Of cables, yeah. yeah. Or, or the wiring inside the components, all that stuff. So bottom mm -hmm. line is that was mathematically calculating it. So anyway, materials matter, right? Yeah, of course. So, I think that's a fair point, though, because people talk about things like this all the time, um, diminishing returns. So the value you get from a very cheap thing, obviously, is different than what you get from a very high-end thing. If you spend $5 on something and it works, you get way more value out of that sure. than if you do if you spend $100,000 on something and it sounds amazing, 
right? Because sure. the, the difference is nowhere near the price discrepancy. Yeah. The question is how much it matters to you. Yeah, there's not and a lot of value people, proposition mm. in it's a tough, ultra high end stuff. <laughs> it's a tough sell, I guess, yeah. in comparison. But it's really not about value. The shocking thing is how much it can matter to some people. Because some people, that last 0.1% is a world of difference. Like at a trade show. We see these people all the time, random people all the time that have varying degrees of experience, varying degrees of familiarity with gear and whatnot. Yeah. And um, sometimes people can't hear a difference between something that you think is shocking and it, it could be stunning, right? Sometimes somebody can't hear a difference and you yeah, think you it's a huge difference, it's right? Obvious. But to them, they don't care. It doesn't matter to them. And other people, there's a difference you can't even pick up and they could so reliably discern it. And they think it's a huge night and day difference. Yeah. And so perception is huge here too, because maybe that 0.2% doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're used to hearing it a certain way, 0.2% could be quite exaggerated. That 0.2% difference could perceived as maybe five, 10, well, what 20%. The, what they're really see. hearing there is a difference in an, ele in an electrical resonance. Whatever, okay. However you want to quantify that, okay? Uh, they're hearing a difference. And so what we started doing years ago is we were translating that into mechanical resonances, which if I recall, if you look at formula, I believe mechanical and electrical resonances are very similar in terms of calculating in, in mathematical formula. They're, they're I almost, I enough. think the formulas are transposable. But anyway, that goes back too many years for me from school. So, but bottom line is that, the, um, uh, that they're similar. So, you know, take, I'm not saying that, you know, the way a material sounds electrically would be the way it sounds mechanically, but maybe, um, you know, like in the case of the materials with our diaphragm materials, I mean, look at how many things we tried. Well, I mean, I had a, I, I had a particular sound I was after. Yeah. I knew the sound. I just didn't know what material would create that. It was a particular resonance that I wanted out of the material, and I could just go like that, and like we couldn't find it. Right. Yeah. Well, we had stacks of materials and just trying them all, just trying everything. Just kind of knew what it would sound like, just by like rapping on this table, Yeah. right? You, you, you get a resonant out of it, right? Or any material. And um, you just get a feel for it after a million years of doing this, what you're after in terms of, if you, if it, you know, you crinkle something and it's got a sharp crinkle to it, well, that's probably gonna translate to a mechanical resonance you're gonna hear if you use it as a speaker driver. You know, sure. same as if same as if you crinkle something like a piece of cotton and it doesn't make any sound, probably well, yeah. again probably going to translate into the sound of a speaker well, it driver. Makes a sound in a way. Yeah. You know, that's the resonant character of that that material, and that's why I think you see a lot of companies, especially the guys like Bowers and Wilkins stuff. You know, Kef, the guys have been doing this a long time. They're they're using a combination of materials, right? Like yeah. Well, they said it took them seven years to find their new driver material for their new 800 series. And yeah, for the yeah. tweeter or the woofer. The, woofer, yeah. Yeah. The continuum cones. Yeah, they were using Kevlar, Kevlar for a long yeah. time. Yeah, which is great stuff. Yeah. But it wasn't just Kevlar. Like they layered it in with, right. you know, basically a resin and. Then they dope that to dumb it to to, uh, to, to, to. I think most people would understand that different materials are going to sound different for the same application. I think that's pretty clear, at least compared to electrical I resonances. Yeah. I mean, you think about even just a bass driver, like a simple test is you take a woofer, right? You just lightly tap your finger on the cone. Yeah. It has a sound. Sure. And all, all different woofers have different sounds. Yeah. The aluminum woofers certainly have a different sound. They ring different. They resonate differently than like you know yeah. a paper cone versus. And that's kind of what we're getting in here with the subtleties of uh, a driver design as you're dealing with not only the breakup modes of the material where different frequencies travel along at certain ways and obviously cause potential side effects. Um, yep. You know, other frequencies being created in a mod, whatever it is. And um, so, yeah, you're, you're really, the, the perfect driver supposedly is massless and infinitely rigid, right? But I don't know how good that would, if you could do well, that. If you could do that, I'm not sure how good that would really sound. Well, see, it know? depends on everything. So maybe the perfect diaphragm substrate would be massless and infinitely rigid, but that would assume that everything else is perfect. Yeah. yeah. Well, we used all kinds of materials on our drivers uh, to try to get that particular sound. I mean, like yep. some of the basic stuff, like. Um, uh, well, we started with mylar. Yeah. And uh, you know, it was easy to get. Yeah. <laughs> Got all different. Thicknesses. Well, just about everybody uses it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, and, it's very uh, common. Uh, initially, it was uh, mylar was and, a, yeah. and what? Capton. Capton. Yeah. yeah. The mylar is easy to get. Yeah. It's all kinds of thicknesses and blah, blah, blah. But. Yeah, you can get it really thin. Yeah, you can get it in any width. It's not custom. Well, mylar, so. mylar is polyester. 
Yeah. So yeah. think of polyester. Like you yeah. hear the word polyester, but you can almost hear how it sounds. Oh, uh, <laughs> sure, <laughs> kind of, because I've heard it, you know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah. But yeah. But I mean, you think when you take a pair of uh, a piece of mylar or whatever, you know, like, I mean, when they make balloon, those aluminized balloons are mylar yeah. or mm -hmm. polyester, right? Or you think, well, how that has a particular sound to it, right? And you make a diaphragm out of that, and you're, it's going to translate that resonance, particularly in a headphone. Well, it also has character. It, it, to it your stretches. Ear. You know, well, that's true. It stretches a lot, which yeah. is an ideal. It's susceptible to uh, heat, heat, and yeah. probably humidity too. Yeah. yeah, to some extent. It has pretty poor thermal properties for yeah. how we would want to use it. Yeah. I mean, they use it in speaker drivers all over the place. The cheap yeah. little Chinese yeah, yeah. speakers that come with, in, in a lot of the low-cost headphones, are all mylar. Yeah, yeah. They're all though, that clear diaphragm is but mylar. They're a lot thicker. So a lot way it's, thicker. It's yeah. not right. as much. Well, of a that problem. mitigates a lot of the issues. Yeah. And in those a applications, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. It's playing music. It yeah. doesn't. You know, it's a two-dollar. It's a two-dollar headphone. Yeah, right. So yeah, works great for that. Yeah. It is waterproof. Well, yeah. well, it is. Yeah. Water resistant. Yeah. Water resistant. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, we've gone way. I mean, looking at that, I mean, that's a very simple material that's been out for a long, long time, and it's just easy to use and all that stuff. But it didn't fit our bill. I mean, it was you know, it had an obvious sound and an obvious character, and um, it's not what we were after. Yeah. We we're after a lack of. How long did it take us to settle on our diaphragm material? It was a long Two time. Two and a half, three years maybe? Yeah. It was a long time. At least. It wasn't a daily I think no. we did because it was basically well, something that had to... Well, we, had, to we, find we were it. continuously getting manufacturers sending us samples of materials. Yeah. You know? And then the question is, the, and the real issue was the material had to be usable. We had to put a uh, conductive trace on it. That was... Oh, well, yeah, that was I think that's a big challenge. You couldn't use like woven cotton. Yeah, you know? right. Oh, wow. There's a lot of practical <laughs> limitations. Because there's, there's dream materials, right? Sure. Yeah. But yeah. it's not really feasible on any type of scale to be able to tension it, mount it reliably, have it handle the thermal stresses, even something like shipping, or be able to tolerate drops or something like that. You can't really feasibly make it out of two nanometer, um, well, really anything in that thickness. Like any type of nanometer grade diaphragm that's extremely rigid is going to be not only very problematic to deposit some sort of electrical trace on, but mm -hmm. you're going to have issues with uh, presenting it against shock or something like that, or thermal stresses. Yeah, because it gets to a point where it's thin, and obviously the thinner it gets is more fragile. And yes. Yeah, so you're well, running in the field, you're running all kinds of Even things. before the field, it's hard to deal with when you actually yeah, make it. Yeah, well, that's it, the thing. Properly know. tensioning something yeah, like yeah, that is right. difficult enough. I mean, yeah. we've got, like, we custom-made, uh, you know, these vacuum jigs just to very precise jigs with digital readouts. Just yeah, to, it was over a year maybe just, yeah. Yeah. working we, on tension. Yeah, you were on yeah. like revision F or G. No, no, they're know. numbered. It's yeah, five. they're numbered. Five? five. Yeah. Well, on the yeah. larger size. On the large one, one. Yeah. 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 It was about 13 jigs, I think, yeah. somewhere around there. Yeah, just to try to get the, 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 the just the material, the, because our material is thin enough as it is, just to get the diaphragm material to sit flat yeah. Yeah. to apply it, uh, to get the proper tension on it before you apply a, you know, a, a, some sort of structure, a rigid structure, we call it tensioning ring to it. The entire assembly is what's critical. And so in tensioning, it isn't so much as you need to design something to be able to tension this. Maybe that's how some people approach it, but personally I found the best approach is to design the system around it being possible to tension repeatedly. And so there's actually diaphragm changes that have been made to accommodate our tensioning methods. Yeah. Uh, and of course the tensioning methods have been refined over the years, but I treat the entire thing as a system and so it, it isn't one thing that you're trying to adjust to be able yeah, to tension right. it. The entire yeah. system needs to change. Yeah. Well, the diaphragm, right. the, the trace pattern, the, the coding packages have changed to be able to accommodate uh, the de deposition of the traces and well, the tensioning. And you can roll all that right into the subjective side of it. It actually has to sound good when you're done. Well, yeah, that too, yeah, of course. Yeah, well, that, right? yeah. that, that all loops back, yeah. like a big feedback loop, back, yeah, over to, and over, back, yeah. back yeah. to the material science of it, yep. how the materials are applied. You know, yeah, it's it's a it's a that whole process has to come out very positively. Sure, and it's really easy at our level. It's really easy to screw it up. Oh yeah, you know but I mean, I the, mean, the, it's very helpful. It's like oh, that, we tried a lot of things. Like oh, that didn't work. You well, know, it's or, it's the most helpful thing is is that we can, we're back there making the drivers and then listening to them. Right. So you know what you did. Yeah. Right. So then you could you know and make because a procedure. we do this in house. Yeah. We can we can institute can do, changes within a couple hours. Yeah, relatively you know, quickly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, this one's getting a little bit long, but uh, wrap yeah, this we can one talk up for a while. <laughs> um, but uh, we're gonna try something new and have a part two to this um, that will continue on the same topic.
So as always, we'd love it if you comment, give us your feedback. We read pretty much every comment. Um, we'd love to be able to answer your questions in a future video. Subscribe if you haven't already, and we'll see you on the next one. Yeah. And so I guess people would be unaware because we've never, as far as I know, publicly said this, but we, we get the blank substrate and we apply coating packs and deposit the trace pack ourselves mm -hmm. in-house. And I don't believe anybody knows how we're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> but we're doing it in a very non-traditional well, way. We created our own processes to do it. Yeah. We, we modified, we, mo we, f we used a number of things that were yeah. non-common. Right. Modified machinery.